Hi, this is Ted. Um, I'm going to be talking about Jeremiah Johnson today, and a lot of these people that I dig into, Jeremiah Johnson, Paula White, Kenneth Copeland, all these other, and a lot of, quite a few others, as I start sometimes, for some of them, I didn't like them any at all, no matter what. I'd like, oh, these guys are creepy, and I just, whatever. I just knew I just wouldn't find anything. But some of them, I really want to find good in them. And Jeremiah Johnson's one of them. I really felt like maybe the Holy Spirit is really doing something in his life. Why would I say that? Because he repented. Now, I didn't get the whole story. I, I didn't get the before and the after. I'm getting the after right now as I went through one of his messages, an entire hour and a half at a service that he went to. And I wanted to believe and really hoped that the Holy Spirit was leading him into some new stuff. Not the kind of new stuff I heard him talking about. And I am really disappointed. I spent the last couple days in, I wouldn't call it sorrow, but it was really, it was heartbreaking. So maybe sorrow. I really felt this deep burden. And I think in part because with him, I see similarities. I was steeped in the charismatic movement in, the, in that I really wanted to just listen to all the different teachers and all that kind of stuff. I, was, I just wanted to really dig in and learn everything I could because I believed with all my heart that these teachers held some kind of authority and, and knowledge that could help me get deeper in Christ and deeper in my emotional feelings and, and everything that I wanted out of God. And I went to tons of churches. I went as many as I could get because to me, okay, I just got out of the drug scene. And for me, this was the most fun and exciting place to be is in church, worshiping and learning and digging in and through all this, I never really got a deep, connected group, one group that I hung with. The people I did hang with went to different churches and different fellowships. So there was no, what, discipleship or accountability in my life to anybody. Sometimes I wanted accountability. Sometimes I wanted somebody to look up to, somebody that I could ask questions on a regular basis and get answers on a regular basis. But I didn't have that. But I had the Bible. And I had a few good Christians on station with me. Now Ray and I, he was my best friend, as I mentioned, we didn't go to the same church. But Ray and I, we'd, we'd just get all excited about Jesus together. We'd go out and witness. And he taught me a couple of things, but they were basic things. Use the Bible when you witness. Don't just don't just go there and tell, knock somebody on the head and say, you shouldn't drink. <laughs> I did that once. It was real effective. Not. Um, but I realized that I needed to use the scripture. And because I saw him using scripture and the guy was eating out of Ray's hands because Ray would use scripture. And at that point I learned, use scripture. And I got good at witnessing, by the way. So we do things like that. And, and that's the kind of group that I had. We didn't hold each other accountable for anything, but we just got excited about Jesus together. And it was the same with people on the ship that I got close to, Tom Booth, literally. Tom Booth, the great, great, great grandson, I think that's how many greats, of Tom Wilkes Booth who killed Abraham Lincoln. Now Tom Booth, I believe he became an Assemblies of God pastor, but Tom and I would, would uh, likewise get all excited about Jesus together on this ship. So I didn't have people holding me accountable, and I'm glad I didn't for several reasons. I will go through, and then I'm going to be presenting this and what I see in Jeremiah Johnson. So I've been in, in the Lord for, uh, oh, just one month, and I get steeped in the charismatic teachers. I just fall in love with them. I, I, I want to know all about demons getting possessed by Christians. 
casting them out and stuff like that. I had a ministry of doing that. I had a ministry in growing legs out and all that kind of stuff. I wouldn't call it a ministry, but I just did it. And I talked to people about it when I'd witness. And eventually, it was the first thing that came to me that was a little bit off. As I was reading the book of Romans, a revelation, the Holy Spirit was helping me to see that in Christ there is freedom. There is so much freedom. And this went in such contrast to all that I learned about Christians being demon-possessed and worrying about Satan about this, worrying about Satan about that. And granted, yes, yeah, Satan exists, and yes, yeah, Satan will do all kinds of stuff behind the scenes. But I was obsessed with that. And when I was reading all about, and the Holy Spirit was revealing to me of the freedom that we have in Christ, my very first thought was, but what about all these experiences I've had? And I end up in Pittsburgh last year, invited by Bill Hammond, and they're asking me to share about what happened to me. Dude, you were like soaring so high, all the television, all the money, all the networks, and what happened? So I stand up and say, yeah, this is what happened. We were trying to follow the will of God. I felt like I missed it. I repented. And then all of a sudden, this crazy storm has blown. The money's gone. The influence is gone. I, I'm questioning whether I'm even called as a prophetic voice or not. I'm having visions of me working at Mickey D's. And I go to get down off the stage and a couple of prophets that I'd never met before come up and they say, you got to stay up on the stage, bro. And the next thing that I know, these guys surround me and begin to bind the power of witchcraft over my life. All I can tell you is I began, if you didn't know me, you would have thought I was possessed by a demon. My body began to convulse under their decrees, and I literally, I remember, I, 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 I was, I don't know if you've ever had those experiences where the Lord is so on you, it's like you go limp. I, I it, it took the strength off of me, and I don't know if you know a woman, Anna Werner, such a sweetheart. She grabs my face, okay? It's the closest you would want to be to a woman's face as a married man, okay? She grabs my face and she says, you are not a false prophet. And I break the power of shame off of your life today. It was the most embarrassing moment of my life, okay? It's like the Lord just undressed me in front of the company of the prophets on July 7th, excuse me, in the month of July on the 21st day. And Bill says, Habakkuk 2 says, in the seventh month on the 21st day. The latter will surpass the former. Wow. Bishop Joseph Garlington, a respected African-American leader, he takes the mic spontaneously. He comes down to the front and he sings a song over me called I Will Restore. I woke up the next morning, July 22nd. I'm, talk, I'm not talking about a, a distant memory, okay? I'm talking about last year, like five months ago. I wake up in the hotel the next morning, and I don't know if you've ever done drugs, I hope you haven't, but when you get off of them, it's like you start seeing in color for the first time. I woke up the next morning feeling, oh my God, I called my wife, honey, I feel 10,000 pounds lighter. I can see something's broken off of my life. I feel like my mantle is rejuvenated. I felt such a freedom getting delivered from demons. I felt something lift off my shoulders.
What about this experience? And the very next verse, let God be true and every man a liar. And when I read that, oh, now at that time it didn't really, it wasn't a crushing thing. Sometimes you get these revelations and you realize, boy, this is going to be heart ch life changing. That wasn't. That was just, okay, what else am I going to do? I was planning on spending the Christmas vacation I was going to have from the service, uh, Christmas leave I was going to spend going to these conferences uh, with charismatic leaders. So maybe I'll just go home. And I took Ray with me, and we went off to Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Actually, I was stationed in Jacksonville, Florida at the time. We went off to Milwaukee, Wisconsin, just on the spur of the moment. You know, I said, hey, let's go to Milwaukee tomorrow. Sure. And we all went to Milwaukee. We both did. All right. Later on, I don't know when, but somehow I get all this kind of confused. But I think it was just days later, after returning from Milwaukee, down in Jacksonville, Florida, I'm at Ray's house. And I'm all excited about the Lord and just really excited. And I think God is so awesome and so neat. And I lie down on Ray's couch. I don't know what Ray was up to. Maybe he was cooking or something. But I, I got to a half dream state or half sleep state and I dreamt a dream. And I saw in the short distance a rock, a large rock. I, for some reason I keep on thinking it's about 30 feet tall and it was glorious. And I said, I want to build my house right here. And a voice said, why don't you build on the rock? Now, at that time, I always thought God was talking to me about this, about that, this. I, I was doing kind of what Kenneth Copeland does in his messages where he'll preach and, is that right, Lord? Should I say that? <laughs> he does that kind of stuff because God's talking to him in his messages. Um, and at that time, I, God was talking to me all the time about things. But this particular dream vision, I didn't think much about it. I just got up and, uh, because it just didn't relate to anything. I couldn't put, it just didn't fit. Shortly thereafter, and I'm not 100% sure of all the timeline. I, I actually wrote this down in, in a little autobiography and in another uh, blog. But shortly thereafter, a girl came up to me and she prophesied over me. And she said, you are going to be a great prophet. All right. Pride overwhelmed my heart. I, you know, all along, I read the Bible a lot. And in this particular case, it was so, it was so that I read the Bible more than ever. I was overcoming things in areas all over the place in my life. I, my life was because I knew I was going to be a prophet. And I just held on to that. And through that whole time period, there's something that I asked on occasion. Because, you know, as I'm going through this, God is, God is, at least I believe God was leading me, helping me to understand more and more about the Bible. And I asked God, the Holy Spirit, I said, God, why are you not guiding me to Jesus Christ's ministry? That comes later, God would tell me. Okay. One day I'm reading, this is months later, and I was in Baltimore, Maryland. Our ship was in dry dock. And uh, while I'm reading, I'm reading 1 John, and, and I read, the Spirit of Christ will confess that Jesus Christ, or the Spirit of God will confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. The Spirit of Antichrist will not confess that. 
and my heart sunk. And I heard God tell me, no, that comes later. <laughs> and I said, no, it doesn't come later. That day I gave up everything. Sure, I had made a step out of the charismatic movement, but a lot of their teachings still hung on because it's all I knew. Sure, I stepped out of the charismatic movement in a lot of ways and stopped going to the churches. Well, I actually shouldn't say I stopped because I still went, even after this experience I went to some. So it was a slow, you know, people don't just jump out all the time. Sometimes they have to learn one thing at a time. And in this particular case, I had to learn I'm not a prophet. I wanted to be a prophet. Now, I already explained to you how I got out of becoming a prophet and out of being a prophet. And in that time period where God was revealing to me through the scriptures that I'm not going to be a prophet. He was revealing to me that I was following the wrong way because I was not grounding myself in Christ. A couple things happened. I later on realized that that vision dream that I had was spot on. It didn't guide me anywhere. It just was spot on where I was at. I loved the thought and the, the everything about Jesus, everything about him. But I did so from a little bit of a distance. Why? Because I was not grounded on Jesus Christ and him crucified. That was not the center of my faith. The center of my faith was me being a prophet. And before that, experience. Those were the centers of my faith, grabbing on to the latest and the greatest, just trying as hard as I could to experience as much as I could from God. But those are not solid foundations for living for Christ. Now, after I was humiliated, okay, it was weeks long, you know, the Bible says, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. But that's in the context of be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to sorrow, your joy into heaviness. Then it says, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. So I did. I abandoned all my dreams. I abandoned all my hopes. I started all over with all my learning. It was, it was humbling because I had to, to go back to the beginning and all the things, I was so proud of what I was learning. <laughs> and I had to let it all go. And it was really, really hard on me. The Holy Spirit revealed to me I was not going to be a great prophet. Now, to Jeremiah Johnson. The thing with Jeremiah Johnson is sometimes I really, really want to see other people, especially leaders in the charismatic movement, experience God correcting them. And it, I don't expect them all of a sudden overnight to be, I repent of all the things that I've done, my whole ministry and everything. So when I see Jeremiah Johnson repenting, quote unquote, of something that he's been saying and doing, and when I see him giving up his ministry and restarting, I have hope. I really do. I have hope that somehow God, by his Holy Spirit, is guiding him out slowly from this prophetic movement. From this movement that takes just people's ideas, people's ideas, not God's, people's ideas, and, and exalt them to become the voice of God. So when I hear him repenting, I'm thinking, maybe this is the person. Maybe it could happen. Yeah, he's not going to be completely, <laughs> uh, completely 
right right away. He's, he's going to go through struggles. He's going to go through all kinds of stuff. And it's a process. It's going to take him years, perhaps. But I watched this video. 2022. The dream he has about 2022. And I listened to everything he preaches. And my heart sank. I copied down for... I think it was four pages. I write down time he says something, and then I write out real quickly what he says. For an hour and a half of his talking, I'm doing this. So I have four pages of summarizing what he's saying. And all I can see is he may have come in contact with the Holy Spirit, trying to help him take steps out but Bill Hammond, who believes he is the one who really started this whole prophetic movement, talks to him on a day he's going through some struggles because of all the hate he gets from repenting of saying that Donald Trump is going to be the president. And he gets hate mail and death threats, and, and he re realizes the charismatic movement is not as great as I thought. I'm thinking maybe he's going to learn some stuff. So Bill Hammond comes and says to him, the latter will surpass the former. Quoting, quoting what Jeremiah says is Habakkuk 2. Well, the problem is this is not Habakkuk 2, and that's not exactly what was in the scripture. It comes from Haggai 2, verse 9. The glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house. He's talking about the temple. Fifty some years before the temple was built, maybe 70 years before the temple was built, I don't know, I can't remember how long the temple was in building the, the second one. A former temple had been destroyed. And people who who the older people who remembered that old temple, the other one wept when they saw the new one built, even though they helped build it. They wept because they remembered the former. And other people rejoiced, the younger people rejoiced because they were able to build this great temple. And Haggai, the prophet, says to those older people, don't worry, because the glory of this present house will outshine the glory of the past. Anyway, to kind of conclude, what I saw in Jeremiah Johnson is that he, because he has this surrounding, which I never had, thankfully, of people encouraging him back in, welcoming him back in that prophet community, prophetic community, He's just turning right back to it. I did not see anything that I would consider growth. Now, maybe from his point of view, there's some stuff that's going on that I don't see, no doubt. But it really, really sank my heart to see that. Because we are not going to, at least anytime soon, we are not going to see Jeremiah taking steps away from the deceit that he's steeped in. And this is Ted. You all have a good day.